Hello, welcome. Today we start our study in one of the great books of the Old Testament, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel is about God and how God established part of his eternal kingdom on earth through three of the most famous men in the Old Testament, Samuel, Saul, and David. Samuel was the last of the judges, the first of the prophets, and the kingmaker who anointed Israel's first two kings, Saul and David. God used Samuel to change the course of Israel's history by ushering in the time of the kings. What kind of man was Samuel? Well, before we meet Samuel, let's meet the spiritual beacon in his life his mother, Hannah. First Samuel teaches us how God can use one person to change history. God used Samuel and his mother, Hannah, to change the history of Israel. God can also use us Christians right where we live, study, and work to be change agents in our world and in God's eternal kingdom. Let's begin with prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, and I thank you now as we study in this wonderful book of 1 Samuel that you will teach us through your Holy Spirit the things that we need to remember, to know, to learn, to be, and to do. We ask this in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 1 begins with Samuel's father. There was a man from Ramah, Thaim, Zophim, another name for Ramah, Ramah, in the hill country of Ephraim. His name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, and Ephraimite. Now, don't get lost in the geography or the genealogy. Samuel's father, Elkanah, lived in Ramah in Israel. That's about 15 miles north of Jerusalem. So if you see Jerusalem there uh, to the west of the Dead Sea, then go 15 miles north and you will see uh, Ramah. Now, Remember that Israel is a very tiny country. The whole of Israel from north to south would fit uh, or only be about the size of our state of Vermont, as you see there on the United States map on the right, the little state in red. Vermont, of course, is the beautiful state that is the home state of our 2020 uh, presidential candidate and Senator Bernie Sanders. Elkanah lived in the territory of the tribe of Ephraim, but he was really from the tribe of Levi. So let's look at his genealogy. Going to 1 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 33, these are the men who served with their sons. From the Kohathites, part of the tribe of Levi, son of Samuel, son of Elkanah, his father, and then moving on through backwards, son of Kohath, son of Levi, son of Israel. Samuel, Elkanah's son, was a Levite. That was the priestly tribe. Later in 1 Samuel, we're going to see how Samuel performs priestly duties, especially sacrifices, which only a Levite could do. Now, 1 Samuel is a masterpiece of storytelling. In verse 1, the author of 1 Samuel shows his deft skill in writing by starting his book with what we would call a false lead. 1 Samuel begins with the words, there was a man. So we think Elkanah is going to be the hero of the story, but he's not. Elkanah's first wife, Hannah, the mother of Samuel, is the heroine, or to use our 21st century English, she is the hero of the first part of this story. So in verse 2, the narrative pivots to the woman who will be the protagonist in this first part of the great narrative in verse 2. Elkanah had two wives, the first named Hannah and the second named Penina. Penina had children, 
but Hannah was childless. Here we see Elkanah's biggest failure in life. He was a bigamist. Elkanah had married two women. His first wife was named Hannah, which in Hebrew means grace. What a beautiful name. And presumably because Hannah could not have children, Elkanah took a second wife named Penina, which in Hebrew means coral. Now the type of coral here may have been ruby colored, that is red colored. So was Penina a redhead? Well, we don't know. But Penina was able to have children, so fertility becomes the conflict in this little family in Israel, and it's a problem that the Lord will have to solve. Now, Elkanah obeyed God's word in other areas of his life, so he must have known about God's great miracles back in the book of Genesis, when God supernaturally gave children to women who could not conceive, like, for example, Sarah, the wife of Abraham, Rebekah, the wife of Isaac, and Rachel, the wife of Jacob. For three generations, God gave children miraculously through those women. But Elkanah did not have enough faith to believe that God could give him and Hannah a miracle baby, like God had given miracle babies to those great women in the history of Israel. So Elkanah took matters into his own hands. And he came up with a culturally acceptable solution by marrying a second wife, but that was not God's will. Jesus tells us what God's will for marriage is in Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verse 4. Haven't you read, Jesus replied, that he, that is God, who created them in the beginning, made them male and female. And God also said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. God's will for marriage is one man and one woman joined in holy matrimony for life. So as a result of Elkanah's disobedience to God's word in marriage, both of his wives suffered. Christian, don't run ahead of God. Give God a chance to prove himself strong in your life. God can solve that problem that you have that seems like it has no solution, and he can solve it without you trying to solve it yourself. Verse 3, this man would go up from his town every year to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were the Lord's priests. The author of 1 Samuel mentions Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, at the end of verse 3. Now, even though we haven't met them yet, we shall read about them in the next chapters, and they were uber bad guys. Mentioning Hophni and Phinehas here is like in Star Wars playing the Darth Vader theme music. Bum, 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 ba, bum, bum, ba, bum, 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 ba, bum, bum, ba, bum. And so we have the Hophni and Phineas theme music being played here to let us know that the bad guys are coming. So come back next time and we'll read just how bad these two bad hombres were. Now Shiloh came was about 15 miles north of Ramah, which as you remember was about 15 miles north of Jerusalem. And Shiloh was where the tabernacle was located. Now the tabernacle was that ancient tent built by Moses after the children of Israel left Egypt and where they made sacrifices and where they worshiped God. Now verse three, it's the first time in the Old Testament that we read God's great name, Lord of Hosts. Lord of Hosts translates God's personal name, Yahweh or Jehovah, plus the word Sabaoth, which means hosts. So this tells us this name that God is the supreme camp commander of Israel's armies on earth, of the planets and stars in outer space, and the armies of angels in heaven. Basically, this name of God, Lord of Hosts, means that God's in charge. God is in command. The question is, do you believe that? 
Do I believe that? Verse 3 also tells us something important about Elkanah spiritually. Elkanah obeyed God's word by taking his family to worship God in Shiloh. Let's look back at Deuteronomy 16, verse 16 for the command. All your males are to appear three times a year before the Lord your God in the place he chooses. Everyone must appear with a gift suited to his means according to the blessing the Lord your God has given you. And then in another place in Deuteronomy, chapter 12, beginning in verse 18, you must eat them, that is the sacrifice, in the presence of the Lord your God at the place the Lord your God chooses, you, your son and daughter, your male and female slave, and the Levite who is within your gates. Rejoice before the Lord your God in everything you do. Elkanah took his role seriously as the spiritual leader of his family. Elkanah set the example for his children and his wives by taking them to worship and to give God an offering at the tabernacle each year, just like God's word had commanded. And at that sacrificial meal, the priest got part of the meat and the family could eat the rest. And that is the setting for our story in this chapter. Dad, be the spiritual leader of your family. Set the example for your children by going to church to worship God. Let your kids see you read God's word. Let your kids see you pray. Let them see you give offerings to God. No matter what your other failures are, leave your children this spiritual heritage by worshiping God and giving to him so that your children can see you do that. Verse 4. Whenever Elkanah offered a sacrifice, he always gave portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to each of her sons and daughters. But he gave a double portion to Hannah, for he loved her even though the Lord had kept her from con conceiving. Elkanah obeyed God's law and he was fair to his second wife Penina and her children to give them a share of the meat that was offered as a sacrifice, but Elkanah was also unfair to Penina and her kids. By giving his favorite wife, Hannah, who had no children, a double portion of the meat, it must have cut Penina deeply that after her devotion and loyalty to her husband through nine long months of suffering per child, that he would treat her and treat her children so shabbily. And Elkanah stupidly concluded that the extra meat would console Hannah for not having a baby. Elkanah was a typical Neanderthal male. What are the four most important S's in life to most guys? Steaks, sports, sex, and sleep. Elkanah's unfair treatment of Penina caused her to take out her justifiable anger at him by taking it out on Hannah. The end of verse 5 is the author of 1 Samuel's inspired commentary about why Hannah was unable to conceive a child. A caring God was in sovereign control of when Hannah had a baby. One of the Bible's most important teachings is that every child conceived is a marvelous creation of God. And we must be very careful tampering with God's work in a woman's womb. For in Psalm 139, beginning in verse 13, the psalmist tells us, For it was you, Lord, who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wonderfully made. Your works, Lord, are wonderful, and I know this very well. God is in sovereign control of conception and birth, life and death. In God's eyes, no child is unplanned. No child is unwanted. No child is an accident or an inconvenience. Every child is created in God's image, no matter how deformed or disabled in our eyes. And each precious child, from conception to birth, 
deserves our prayers, protection, rescue, and respect no matter how poor or unlikely to succeed in life. Hannah could not conceive because God was waiting until just the right time to give her a son who would change the history of Israel and the world. Do you believe that God is in control of all things like that? Now, Elkanah's disobedience in marrying two women resulted in terrible consequences and suffering in his family. Look at verse 6. Her rival, that is Hannah's rival, Penina, would taunt her severely just to provoke her because the Lord had kept Hannah from conceiving. Whenever she went up to the Lord's house, that is to the tabernacle, her rival Penina taunted her in this way every year. Hannah wept and would not eat. Hannah, why are you crying? Her husband Elkanah asked. Why won't you eat? Why are you troubled? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Here we see the bitter fruit of polygamy, of marrying multiple partners. Penina, whom Elkanah had treated unfairly, takes it out on Hannah, who already had the burden of not being able to have a baby. Now, again, imagine the scene with me. The priest gets part of the sacrifice that's been cooked on the altar. The rest of the sacrifice goes to Elkanah and his family. And so he shares that double portion to Hannah and individual portions to Penina. So imagine the scene. Penina gives a piece of roasted lamb to each of her children. And she says, now, do all of you children have food? Dear me, there are so many of you, it's hard to keep track. And one of her children asks Penina, Mommy, Miss Hannah doesn't have any children. What did you say, dear? I said Miss Hannah doesn't have any children. That's right, dear. Poor Miss Hannah. Doesn't she want children? Oh, yes, dear. She wants children very, very much. Don't you, Hannah? Doesn't Daddy want Miss Hannah to have kids? Oh, yes. But... Miss Hannah keeps disappointing Daddy. She just can't have kids. Why not, Mommy? Well, dear, God doesn't let her have kids. Doesn't God like Miss Hannah? <laughs> what do you think, dear? Oh, Hannah, by the way, did I tell you I'm pregnant again? And so it went on, year after year, until Hannah couldn't take it anymore. Ladies, do your best not to be catty. And even if you are on the receiving end of cattiness, don't retaliate. Return kindness for cattiness. Meow. And Elkanah, of course, the crowing rooster, did nothing to stop the cackling in the hen house. Although Elkanah loved Hannah, he didn't try to put himself in her sandals. Elkanah could have said, Hannah, you are better to me than ten sons. Oh, no. He says, am I not better to you than ten sons? Wrong answer. Married guys and all you single guys who'd like to get married someday, learn here from Elkanah's bad example. This is not how to talk to your wife, especially when she's crying. A man came home from work, and his wife was bawling her eyes out. He asked, what's wrong, darling? She sniffed, I baked you a birthday cake, and the dog ate it. So he said, don't cry, darling. I'll buy you a new dog. <laughs> wrong answer. Guys, learn to be sensitive to your wife's needs. Don't talk. Listen. Let her cry it out. Ask questions, but don't try to solve her problems. She is not a problem to solve. She is a woman to be loved. And this scintillating advice brought to you by 
a career single guy. <laughs> Verse 9, Hannah got up after they ate and drank at Shiloh. Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's tabernacle. Deeply hurt, Hannah prayed to the Lord and wept with many tears. Making a vow, she pleaded, Lord of hosts, if you will take notice of your servant's affliction, remember and not forget me, and give your servant a son, I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and his hair will never be cut. Here we see Hannah's heart. Instead of fighting with her rival, instead of trying to explain herself to her husband, Hannah goes off alone and just pours out her heart to God. This is one of the most beautiful prayers in the Bible. You know, God can't promise us that he'll always provide another person to listen and sympathize with us. God does guarantee, however, that he is available 24-7 to hear our prayers and to answer our cries. Hannah walks from the camp, family campground to the tabernacle. Apparently, when the Israelites pitched this famous tent at Shiloh, they built a more permanent structure for it. You see here it had wooden doorposts. Moses' original tabernacle had no wooden doorposts. But let's look at a few things now about Hannah's great prayer beginning in verse 11. First of all, she addresses her prayer to the Lord of hosts. She believed that she was really talking to Israel's God, Yahweh or Jehovah, who was in sovereign command of all the armies of the universe. God could get the job done. And notice she calls herself God's servant. She places herself humbly under God's authority. She believed that God was able to answer her prayer. She had faith. She made a vow to the Lord for her son to be a Nazarite. Now, back in Numbers chapter 6, a Nazarite was never to drink wine or grape juice or to eat any grape product like raisins and never to cut his hair. And her boy would dedicate his life to God in full-time ministry service for the rest of his life. Now, it's so important to understand something. Hannah was not bargaining with God. She was not bartering with God. She was not saying, Lord, if you do this, then I'll do that. No. She believed God was able to answer her prayer by giving her a son. So she promised to give that son back to God. There was no doubt in her mind that God was able to do it. The only question was if it were God's will to give her a son or not. When God gave her the son, she would give the son back to God. Have you moms or dads ever dedicated your children to the Lord? The Bible doesn't teach us that babies should be baptized because baptism is a right for only believers who have reached an age where they understand a decision to trust in Christ as Savior, Lord and God. But here and elsewhere, the Bible does encourage Christian parents to dedicate your children to God. If not in a formal ceremony, at least to dedicate your children to God in your hearts. For your children to live for God and to serve Him all their lives, whatever their vocational career. Now, while Hannah is pouring out her heart to God in this beautiful prayer, Eli, the old high priest, father of the two bad guy priests we saw earlier, Eli shows that he's just as clueless as Hannah's husband. Look at verse 12. While she continued praying in the Lord's presence, Eli watched her lips. Hannah was praying silently, and though her lips were moving, her voice could not be heard. Eli thought she was drunk and scolded her. How long are you going to be drunk? Get rid of your wine. Don't miss this. Eli is the most important spiritual leader in the nation, but he's so unobservant, so out of touch, that he mistakes Hannah's silent, agonizing in prayer for being drunk. What an idiot! John Bunyan, author of Pilgrim's Progress, one of the best-selling Christian books of all time, said this, 
in prayer. It is better to have a heart without words than words without a heart. And, of course, that's what Hannah had. Verse 15. No, my Lord, Hannah replied, I am a woman with a broken heart. I haven't had any wine or beer. I've been pouring out my heart before the Lord. Don't think of me as a wicked woman. I've been praying from the depth of my anguish and resentment. Now, a priest is an intermediary, a middleman, a representative, an ambassador between God and human beings. So to give Eli credit when he hears what Anna has to say here, he does respond in the right way. Verse 17, Eli responded, Go in peace, Hebrew shalom, and may the God of Israel grant the petition you have requested from him. Even though Eli was not up to par spiritually, God did use Eli in his prophetic office as priest to assure Hannah that God had heard her prayer and that God would respond to her. Verse 18, May your servant find favor with you, she replied. Then Hannah went on her way. She ate and no longer looked despondent. Notice that what Hannah does next after she leaves the tabernacle. She ate. She no longer looks sad. This is what biblical faith looks like. Hannah took her burdens to the Lord and she left it there with him. When we pray and give the Lord our burden, we need to leave it in his almighty hands. That is what faith is. How about you, Christian? Do you have a burden that you're carrying right now? Is it a heavy burden? Take it to the Lord in prayer and then leave it there. Does your burden return every day? Then pray about it every day and leave it with the Lord every day. Does your burden come back every hour? Then, in like the old hymn, Sweet Hour of Prayer, make every hour a time of prayer where you leave it with the Lord. There's a famous Bill Gaither song, Take Your Burden to the Lord and Leave It There. May I, may you always do that with our burdens. Verse 19. The next morning, Elkanah and Hannah got up early to bow and worship before the Lord. Afterward, they returned home to Ramah. Then Elkanah was intimate with his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. After some time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel because she said, I requested him from the Lord. Once again, in spite of his faults, Elkanah was a devout man. He and Hannah got up early the next morning to worship the Lord before the return trip to Ramah. When they got home, Elkanah was intimate with Hannah. But the Lord did not answer her prayer immediately. Why? Because the Lord is in sovereign control of all things. He's in control of conception and birth. God knew exactly the right time, exactly the right moment for Samuel to come into the world. So it was only after some time that Hannah conceived and had the son that she'd asked God for. Notice in verse 19 it says that the Lord remembered Hannah. What does that mean? When the Lord remembers us, it doesn't mean that he's forgotten and has to be reminded. God can't forget anything because he knows everything. When God remembers us, he thinks about us and he acts on our behalf. We say the very same thing when we say we're going to remember someone on their birthday by giving them a gift. That doesn't mean that we've forgotten that person. It means that we do something for that person. God remembered Hannah by giving her the baby that she'd asked for. And notice that Hannah named her newborn son Samuel, which is a word play in Hebrew. Samuel's name in Hebrew is Shemuel, not Shamu the killer whale, but this sounds like 
Sha'al El, ask of God. So, of course, El is the short form of God's name Elohim in Hebrew. So, Samuel sounds like asked or requested from God. Verse 21. When Elkanah and all his household went up to make the annual sacrifice and his vow offering to the Lord, Hannah did not go up and explain to her husband, After the child is weaned, I'll take him to appear before the Lord's presence and to stay there permanently. Verse 23. Her husband Elkanah replied, Do what you think is best and stay here until you've weaned him. May the Lord confirm his word. So Hannah stayed there at home and nursed her son until she weaned him. The time comes around again for Elkanah and his family to make the annual pilgrimage to Shiloh. Hannah stays home to nurse her baby. Yet she promises that when Samuel is weaned, she will keep her promise to the Lord. And Elkanah approves her request. Now in God's law through Moses, if a wife made a vow, her husband as the spiritual leader of the family had to confirm her vow or it was not valid. We see that in Numbers chapter 30. So Hannah must have told Elkanah about her vow to God. We know that he approved it because notice Elkanah says, may the Lord confirm his word. This means that Elkanah also had to be willing to dedicate and give up his son, firstborn son of his favorite wife, to God. That took faith on Elkanah's part. So once again, as we've seen, the characters in this wonderful book of 1 Samuel aren't just good guys and bad guys, but it's the bad guys have some good, and the good guys often have a lot of bad. Verse 24. When she had weaned him, she took him with her to Shiloh, as well as a three-year-old bull, or three bulls, half a bushel of flour and a jar of wine. Though the boy was still young, she took him to the Lord's house, that is the tabernacle, at Shiloh. Then they slaughtered the bull and brought the boy to Eli. In ancient times, and even today in the global south, or east, eastern countries, some children are not weaned, until they're three or four years old. So Hannah may have kept Samuel with her until he was at least four years old. But then she kept her vow to God. For Samuel's dedication ceremony, Hannah brought either a three-year-old bull or three bulls as an offering along with the flour and the wine. This was a huge offering. It tells us that Elkanah was a man of some financial means to be able to give an offering of this that was this expensive. Now, perhaps five years have gone by since Hannah's prayer that Eli heard. So, notice what she says in verse 26. Please, my Lord, she said, as surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this boy. And since the Lord gave me what I asked him for, I now give the boy to the Lord. For as long as he lives, he is given to the Lord. Verse 28. Then he, or she, or they, bowed in worship to the Lord there. It's not clear just who was worshiping God here because the Hebrew and other version manuscripts are divided. Did Elkanah bow in worship? Did Eli bow in worship? Was it Hannah? Probably the whole family worshiped God. But the most astonishing possibility is that the he may refer to Samuel himself. Could a four-year-old child bow in genuine worship to God? If it was Samuel, who worshiped God at this young age. It indicates what an extraordinary person Samuel would grow up to be. Hannah and her husband standing there with her kept their promise to give their son Samuel to God. I'm sure it wasn't easy to give up this boy, the boy that she had longed for and prayed for all those years. But there's every indication that Hannah 
did it gladly. Believer, when you give a gift to the Lord, do you give it grudgingly? Do you give it out of duty? Or do you give your gifts to the Lord because you love him, because he's worthy of that gift, because it gives you such great joy to return to him a little of what he has given to you. I pray that for myself and for you, that we will always give our gifts, be they small or large, to the Lord, because he has given to us the greatest gift of all, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, Lord and God, I would encourage you to believe what the Bible says, that Christ died for our sins and rose again, that Jesus took the punishment we deserve for our sins, that he died in our place and that he rose again on the third day. I'd encourage you, if you never have before, to trust in Christ alone. He's the only one who can make you right with God, the only one that can take you to heaven. Would you pray with me as we close? Father, thank you for this marvelous first chapter of 1 Samuel. And I pray that each of us would take away from it the things that you would have us to know or be or do. And I ask this in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you.